So okay, the, the name is a play on what Aspire does, and how do you compute with numbers, and mathematician came with abstractions that are known as rings. So the rings will come a few times during the presentation, but just think a structure that has addition and multiplication uh, every time you see a ring. Um, so there's a ways to, to contact me, people giving me money and what I do in my spare time. So it's interesting and paid by academia, but they don't pay me to, to work on like open source stuff. Um, I would start by saying like the people who contributed to those projects and even started those projects, because I'm not the, the main author of Spire, I'm just like pushing it forward. Um, and there, there have been like lots of contributions. Um, what, are we, what, what we are going to talk about is type classes for numerics. I think, um, just, just a quick check, like who used uh, type classes and or who is familiar with type classes in this room? Yeah. That's, I would have probably given a very different talk like yesterday, uh, but right, right now I can uh, move, a, move a bit faster on that. Um, soon like delegates, but no, I'm still using the, the old terminology sometimes. And two examples that are, will be part of, the, um, of, of Spire and the libraries it's, it's based on is order that enables you to compare things. But often when you have a, a type class like order, it's, it specializes something that already exists. For example, orders are more specific than partial orders where sometimes the, the relation can fail and partial order is going to be more specific than equality where you could just compare stuff uh, if they are, they are equal. Um, but that's already in CAT's kernel, what uh, Spire puts on top, it thinks to, to compute with numbers, like uh, addition, plus. So that would be like another type class. Uh, but we already have some type classes in the standard lib, so why, why Spire? Why don't we just use, you know, like, like the collection library, where we already have flat map and map, uh, maybe it's good enough. Um, the thing is that the, the standard library gives you just enough so that you can do things like sequence.sum, sequence.sorted, and nothing more. Um, for example, here, uh, you see that the, the, the kind of the inheritance relation in the stunt library, they are weird because everything that's numerical can be compared. But if you look at, for example, complex numbers of polynomials, you can add them, you can multiply them, but they are not ordered on a real line. So you will not be able to use those type classes for more general application than just the um, standard numerical types that are present in, in the standard library. Um, and there are actually interesting things, did I put them somewhere, or I, I'm not that mean, but if you look in the code, there is something like uh, uh, double is a weird fractional or something like that, or tricky fractional, like it kind of, it's kind of fractional, so it's, it's not very lawful, there, there are no laws that are checked, to my knowledge, in, in the center library. Um, so like, the, I put like around those, those white boxes that are the type classes, the operation that you gain by having that, that implicit in scope. Uh, now we move to the type level towers and like, ooh, they're like zero, it's a mouthful, like white. Um, and I even compressed some of the things, so uh, the meet join lattices and logic, it's like a family, it's this complete world in itself, and I put in parentheses all the partial rings, it's another world in itself. Um, maybe let's, spin, let's spend a, a minute on this, on this slide because like if you jump and, and start to use Pyre, this is what you will have uh, in your face when you start. So, Egg, partial order, order, it's already in Cart's kernel. Uh, you're probably a bit familiar with it. Signed, it's when on top of the order you have a notion of a zero and on which side of the zero you, you are. Um, and truncated division, we'll speak about it in a minute. It's a very interesting story. Then you have the semi-group structure. That's what enables you to, for example, concatenate strings with the same operation that you would use to combine numbers, maybe by adding them. Um, and there, like, there is this family of things like uh, culminates in logic. It's basically Boolean operation that work on bit strings, for example. So this is very specialized. I'm, I'm not going to spend time on that. Um, what's interesting for those operations that some operation will commute. For example, two plus three is three plus two. But now if I use the operation of concatenating strings, uh, like the string A plus the string B, it's going to be AB. But if I reverse the argument, then it's BA. It's, it's not the same thing. So we have those variants. And then on the right, uh, it's exactly the same thing as a group modeling or semi-group. We'll look a bit more in the details later. Uh, but sometimes you want to use additive notation or multiplicative notation. So all these things that, that are triplicated in Spire. And some people complain, but maybe we, we should come with a new way to do these things. I'm just putting out there to, for us to discuss. Um, 
on top of the addition and multiplication, you have a series of algebraic structures that tell you all addition relates to multiplication. And the variants are, uh, in, in that stuff, is basically, can you compute inverses for multiplication? For example, with integers, you can't compute the inverse of two. Uh, one half doesn't, it's not an integer. Uh, but maybe if you have a field, you can compute inverses. So this follows basically the textbook mathematics, with a few exceptions. Like for example, in math, uh, unique factorization domains, they should be in, in that tower, like in the middle, but we, for some reason, we put them aside, and that's a design choice. Uh, we'll sp speak about it later. Uh, okay, I wanted to show that just the, we have more stuff than the Scala library. Uh, oh yeah, it's uh, double is conflicted, which is an interesting name. Um, so the plan is going to be this. First, we are going to, lo to look at what's the value of type classes. Like during Saladays, I told people, use Pyre, we have type classes, well, we can just add things. I said, but you know, you have laws and you get tests for free and that's kind of the value that, that we provide. Um, second one uh, I want to talk about is the variance and coherence, that the fact we can create new type classes by just reversing things and what does that mean for our ecosystem. Point three is going to be which, which instances do we provide for standard types? Point four, uh, syntax, I hinted at that, like uh, this replication. Or do we close the lattice when we have like so many variants and then we somehow need to have all combination of type classes available? Uh, and finally, um, sometimes even a math, a math textbook is going to say that thing exists and it's unique, but when you compute with it, you have different ways of getting the results. And maybe when you compute stuff, you, you have more freedom than when to, to pick things than, than when you work with uh, ideal mathematical things. Um, so let's start with laws. What's, uh, um, and what I'd like to do, like this, this old stuff, I'm, I want to do a reverse escalator. Um, so that's going to be that. Uh, the thing is that Ascal sometimes is really bad. Like if you look at the, the prelude, uh, the Ascal report defines no laws for integral, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and somehow you realize that, let's say it, it defines a Euclidean domain. Why not? Uh, and then somehow you have this notion of zero and towards negative infinity. It's a notion of an order. So implicitly they bring the notion of an order into that thing and you don't know if not all Euclidean domains are ordered, like what it is. And that was a problem inspired that we solved and now we are better than Haskell, so maybe they can, you know, escalate stuff from, from us. Um, and that question is what's the person operator? And it's quite fun. Uh, going on the right side, um, it's always like you divide something by something and what remains after you, you've done your division. Um, so for example, seven is three times two plus one. That's not very controversial, but uh, if you look at minus seven, you have two ways of defining it, like minus four times two plus one, or maybe uh, minus three times two minus one. And when you do this modular, modular thing, it's always annoying that you get a negative result. So in green, it's the remainder of the, this division. Because for example, let's say I want to have a ring buffer and say I want to do things modulo one second of sound and I have offsets and, and every time I have something negative then I get a negative offset in that array. It's very annoying to put a while loop every, every time I need to do that. Um, so maybe I want to use a definition that would have a, a plus sign over here, but you know, exactly what do I get? And in the Java library it's very interesting. If you use the person operator you get the sign of the dividend and if you use big integer mod you get the sign of the divisor. So it's not internally consistent. Moreover, if you use floating points, maybe what you should say is that I can divide seven by two. So it's one time 3.5 plus zero, oh sorry, that's one half times seven, uh, this is wrong. Um, no, 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 that, would, that should be 3.5 times two plus zero. Uh, one should be two over here. But that, well, what, I, what I want to say is real numbers, you can always divide, so there should be no remainder. But sometimes you get, actually, when you use the person operator, you get minus one or, or plus one. So, you know, what's this? Um, it's something that we didn't have in, inspired much at, at that time, but you can use also like this, this modulo and remainder stuff to divide polynomials. So in high school, I did like this kind of long division with polynomials, and then you get uh, that the remainder of th th that division should be five. And for us, Inspire, we have polynomials. We want type classes that enable us to do the right thing when people use polynomials on whatever Scala uh, coefficient type. So actually, actually the story, you, you, there is a very nice paper by Microsoft Research. Uh, they look at it. Um, and what you have is that you divide big D by, by small d. Um, you, should, you should get an integer quotient. And, and your, your big D, what you divide, uh, should be 
d times q, the quotient, plus some remainder. That's not controversial. And then, like the, the rest should be smaller than the, 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 the divisor. But smaller with like this, this double line is not necessarily the absolute value. So now we have two interpretations. The first one is about truncated division. It's basically I'm going to divide the red line by the, the blue line, and I get the remainder as a green thing, because I can fit three times the blue thing in the red thing, and I, I, this remains. So I'm going to write like this is three times blue plus, plus green. Um, but here, to, to do that, I need a, a notion of uh, comparing length. So I need an order to do that. And the other notion is this Euclidean division. And then you say it's very abstract. You say like this thing is the Euclidean function, um, which matches the, the disorder definition for like integers. So this is why Spire did not see that problem until, un until uh, much later. Um, but you don't need an order. For example, for polynomial, that's uh, like how big I am, it's the polynomial degree. If I have x to the power 3 or 2 or, or x alone, uh, I take the biggest one, and that's my, that's my Euclidean function. I'm, I'm going to skip over Euclidean division because it's not very, it's, it's not something we all share. Um, but truncated division is. So here you, you, you have the thing with the, the, the length, it's a very nice picture. But when you have signs, uh, you have a bit of freedom. You, you can decide how exactly you, you handle signs. And this is, by the way, um, research in that paper up there, uh, they looked at all programming languages, like how do they handle that thing, and now inspire what it means. We have actually two versions, it's truncated or floor modulus, and you, it either like the result will follow the sign of the dividend or the divisor. So now when I want to index in an array modulo blah and my offset can be negative, I just use F mod and I don't need to uh, bear the pain. So, what I like about this story is that it started as a very abstract question. What's uh, Euclidean division and truncated division and why should I care? And in the end, we provide users a better story because now when you index something on a, that basically loops back, you have a primitive that's sound and uh, super usable. So that's the first part, like uh, what you know, following that law approach bring, brings you. Uh, second story, it's like variance. So, We've heard that uh, a few times from, from Martin during the Scala days and today, that uh, we don't want global coherence. Uh, implicit, like delegates or implicit are local. Um, it's good that people, for example, can reverse an order and when they call uh, the sorted method on, on, on a collection, they can you know, reverse uh, things if, if they need, they need to. Um, the problem is that you can, you can basically have many orders in, in, in your library and which one you using is not going to be checked by the compiler. It's more like the documentation or um, like the, the, basically the culture you have in your project that will, will tell you that. Um, so for example, you need to be super careful that if you have sorted sets that you're always using the same order. Maybe the compiler is not going to check that. Um, and sometimes order is going to be used in combination with other things. Like in this truncated division, we are for sure using an order but it needs to be compatible when you have these multiple uh, type classes at, at the same time. Um, so that was my story 4.2, that we, we have to deal with that uh, second problem. Oh, by the way, I'm not going to give answer during that talk, more like raise issues and you know, like, so what's a type class? And people get into heated debates online, that this is the one way to do it. Uh, I don't think so, and, and here are the, the, the reasons. Um, the third point when we have to make decisions is canonical instances. Um, so we have a summing group, uh, it's in CATS kernel. Uh, it tells you that it's a set and you can combine stuff and it's associative. So you can basically put parentheses where, where, where you want and it means you can just get rid of parentheses, which is really cool to read things. Um, it's also cool for people who do parallel computing because you can just split your sequence in whatever chunks and you compute them in parallel and then you can bring things back together and it's same. So that's, that's the value of that type class. But actually the, Integer addition would not be the only operation that respect that. Multiplication also works uh, and is associative, and like min and max, uh, same thing. So when you, in, in cats, when you, if somebody asks for a summing group of int, what do you do? What do you, what do you give? Um, and this is cultural, like it depends whether you're doing like data processing, you work in mathematics. Uh, as an example, for example, in electrical system, you're going to speak about phases and how you compute phases. Um, if you specify them by an angle, you just add the angles modulo 360 degrees. But if they are complex numbers of modulus one, you multiply them. So which 
which one do you pick? It really depends. Um, as an example, so CATS, what, let's say uh, it's the number of talks I give, I give in the European Union and in North America, and I have a map that tells like, how many talks some, somebody gave. Uh, I know if I combine them, this is doing the right thing. It's adding um, like how many. But if I was looking at something like, let's look at my ma maximum salary over my career so that often in countries like retirement benefits are tied to the highest salary, which is why suddenly like people in this la last year of employment, they do so many uh, additional responsibilities but because then bang, you have a, a nice bonus. Um, but here you would use the max uh, operation, not, not sum. And let's say we look, like in Switzerland, there's this thing that healthcare is so expensive that the state subsidizes it and they look at your revenue. Maybe you look at the revenue over the past three years, the minimum one, you're not going to add things. Uh, so no, 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 this is a problem because or do we um, encode the fact that it's going to be a different summing group uh, every time when we derive the monoid of map string int? Uh, I don't know the, the, the answer to that. Um, fourth point, and it's actually quite cool because we're like 20 minutes in, which means that we're going to be spot on with a nice time to discussion uh, afterwards. It's that when you, have a, when you bring a type class in, in, into your project, not only you bring like the structure and the laws, but you also bring some syntax. Um, and here there is something really different between like working with Scala, working with programming languages, and reading mathematical or, or, or physics papers. In papers, you can do this. You start the paper and you define the notation. If it's some, if you see that using slightly different notation has value for your own paper, so I suppose you have two binary operations, you denote them like blah and blah. Here people put little circles around, so it's not the standard plus, like look, I'm, I'm doing something different. Um, and it's okay in math because your context is always a paper, and we never compose papers together. You, uh, it's the researcher who has to read stuff and you know, like bring, bring them in the same space. Uh, but we, when you write programs, you need to compose and you need to share the notation between the, the different pieces. Um, I'm not familiar with Lisp at all, but I've heard that it's a thing that people basically redefine their world every time they start a project. Um, in Scala, and when you use CATS, like, CATS is going to, to, give you, to tell you what to do with uh, the type classes, like well, what's the syntax. Um, and it means that in Scala, we are going, currently we have duplication. So if we look at groups for like abstract groups, so that's uh, CATS kernel and what Spire does, it's basically the same thing, just with different names. Uh, by the way, Scala Z mixes all these notations, so I, don't, I think this is something all oh, like type level exorcism does, does much better. So like that's combined in, in CATS kernel, uh, it's this kind of square plus operation. It's associative. You have an empty element that basically does nothing when, when combined, and every element has an inverse. It's not semi group, it's group. Every element has an inverse, that gives you, uh, when you combine with the original thing, gives you empty. Um, but you get the same thing with, with integers and, and addition. Uh, addition is associative, you have a, a neutral element which is zero, and every number is a negative number, when you add you, them, you, you, you get to zero. Same thing for multiplication, associative, one is the neutral element, and then every element has a reciprocal uh, element, not zero, this is kind of, partial thing that we do, it's, it's a bit weird, but ex apart from zero, um, this brings you to one. So we have exactly the same structure, the same type class, uh, like in, in, in an ideal platonic book, uh, but b because we are going to use them for to do things, um, we are going to have uh, different structures for that. Um, and kind of the convention right now is that the, the summing group from CATS is going to use for non-numerical things, combining strings, maps, and we are going to use this notation for numerical applications. Um, and we need both of them, actually, because when you, when you do real-world computation, you're going to add and multiply things. So we are going to have type classes that merge um, uh, plus and, 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 and times notation, combining them, and you, we will get additional laws like distributivity, um, which I've written on, on the bottom of the slide. So I don't think there is a nice way out of this. Um, I think we just have to live with the fact that we are going to have triplicate structures and triplicate laws and triplicate uh, test infrastructure. 
But luckily, that this, this only lives in libraries. When you're the user, you just change the name of the thing you're using or change the name of the import for the syntax, and, it, and it's there. Um, I don't know if I wish if Scala had more abstraction to combine and, you know, let's, I want to, I, I have a type A and I want two different group structures on it and one with that notation and one with this other notation. I think it would make things very confusing. So, but I don't know if this is like the, the, the end of the story. But it's the current state of things. Um, aha, uh, controversial things. I've seen that happen all the time, like when, when CAT was built, like people say, no, this is a lawless class, like go to, what's the Ali CAT, so like this kind of, you know, kind of purgatory uh, module. Um, I want to say here that in that context, lawless classes are okay. They are okay if they become, if they contribute in laws when they are used in combination with other things. So for example, uh, oh, there, was there something I uh, did not see happening? Um, for example, if I had this problem when I, I defined a, a library to do linear algebra, and I want sparse vectors and sparse matrices. And the idea of that, that library was to use as little surface as possible, so just to construct a sparse matrix. I don't, I don't want to have arithmetic. I just want to, is something empty or non-empty? So this is all my idea, like semi group and, and monoid structure would look like. Semi group would tell you how to combine things, and empty would tell you, like, this is, this is the empty object, and I can check if, actually, I have also, like, a way to compare for equality. I can check if that's empty. And now I can build, like, my uh, matrix construction things, like field, tabulate, and, and so on. And then the monoid would combine semi group and empty, and, you know, empty has right to exist because it's then part of something uh, bigger. Uh, buh, buh, buh. I think that was the end of that part. Uh, no, it's something really, really uh, fun in Scala. Yeah, so when you have like different capabilities for your type and you want to create like, you know, have a type class at the top of the inheritance uh, lattice uh, for every combination, it becomes extremely messy. So here, and it's, uh, it's not a contrived example, this is what we have right now. We have this list of things on the left, equality, partial order, order, and like, do, you, do we have a sign, and so on. Um, and on the right, we have like, what are the capabilities of our numbers? I don't know. For example, unsigned integers, they don't have a notion of uh, taking the negative, like the negate, we don't have that. So, so we have like, things that live at every step of this ladder on the right, and then if we want to close that hierarchy, we basically need to take the, the all pairs of uh, left and, and right, and that would do, I don't know, 200, 300 classes or traits in, in a library, we, we, we won't do that. Um, the problem is that we, are, we have no support for type class merging, like if I have an instance of that and that, and they are coherent, then okay, you can construct that bigger thing and it gives you additional uh, operations. Um, I don't even know what that would look like. The only kind of structural, structural operation we have is inheritance. But I think it's not too bad because we can use convention here and kind of identify towers, so that's uh, the title of the talk, um, and just close the lattice inside those, those towers. So for example, on the left, uh, we have the ordering tower, and I choose that truncated division would live on, on, on that tower, and then you have all the things related to plus and, and, and multiplication and they don't overlap. Okay, when you ask an instance of big integer, you will get something on, from the left and something from the right, but you don't have a, a combination of both. And that, that keeps you all, uh, some sanity in, in that crazy uh, zoo. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that uh, when we test laws, uh, so, so that's where you see that actually truncated division lives in, in both towers, uh, but we, we made a choice that in the test, you require truncated division, but also a commutative rig. So it's like uh, plus and times, but you don't have negative um, uh, numbers. Um, so this is how we, we do it. That's when you're going to use it, you're going to bring both elements from both towers at the same time. But this is something that's not encoded in the source code, and nobody is going to check that this is coherent and sane uh, because the compiler doesn't know about it. So that's uh, the trade-off here. Uh, last thing, and, and then last one, I'll probably have like four minutes remaining. Um, it's something I struggle a lot with students. Like, I give them the textbook on whatever math we are going to study, and then they go on a computer. And um, often, math textbook tell you something exists, and it's, it's, it's fine. 
Uh, but when you need to go on the computer, you need to pick a data structure and algorithm and so on, and sometimes they don't exist. Or, um, so it's, a, it's a very nice problem, like how do you uh, actually do computation? Here I want to think about unique factorization domains that are like, it's, it's, a, it's something that lives at the very bottom of the kind of ring plus times uh, hierarchy. It just means that you have a concept of a unit for most numbers plus minus one, and you have like prime elements, and you can take every element of your set, and you can do factorization, and it's unique. Um, and if you look like how to do that on the JVM for big integers, you don't have something deterministic, you have this. So you, you, you put some certainty parameters, and Java is going to say, you know, like, um, it's probably prime, or I'm sure it can be factored. But you decide like how much certainty you want to have, and this is the guarantee they give you. If you put certainty big enough, then, I mean, in the end, you, that probability of this being wrong is going to be lower than uh, gamma ray flipping bits in your memory. So, I mean, in the end, practically it's good enough, but um, some people in math would not allow proof, computer proof that are based on, on such uh, arguments. So uh, maybe you want, and, and here we have a problem. We can't provide the type class uh, because you, you would have to pick a certain parameter and maybe between different domains, like you would have you're happy that it takes a day more to compute, but you have more certainty, I don't know. Um, so here, I think the right choice is to let the user choose with imports, like what algorithm they want to use. Uh, but that means that for, for this unique factorization domain, we can't put that in the inheritance uh, hierarchy. We have, this has to live outside. And then you import whatever you need. So with that, I arrive at my conclusion, and I think I'm quite good with the timing here. It's good. Um, so like, there were like the six pain points when designing uh, like um, an API in, in, the, in, in FP. Uh, we've seen that basically having laws is, is not controversial. Um, we have a problem with, with coherence and, and variance of type classes, but this can be probably remedied by, by education, like how to, and patterns, like how to use that properly. Uh, wish we had something better. Canonical instances, this is cultural. You have to pick the one that makes more sense for your user base or maybe leave that open. Uh, syntax, I think here's boilerplate is unavoidable, but if you need to, you have to make uh, choices considering like who is going to use your library. Closing the lattice, easy user tower pattern and algorithm selection, this is not very controversial, but then we realize that the structure of our library is not necessarily going to follow what's in the textbook. So that was like the short summary of this. Uh, why did I make this talk? Because I'm maintaining Spire and now we need to move to, to Scala 3. And it's a good excuse to break all the things. Um, and really like the goal here would be to, to build a mainstream language that has the most robust uh, numerical features. And I, I think we can be, we are already better than Haskell. Um, and that, that can be like the story of Scala, that, that we have that and everybody can use it. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's, thank you. Thanks a lot. Any questions? Of course, Guillaume. So yeah, uh, Outlook. Uh, how do you envision things going forward? Do you think there's going to be some fusion of like algebra, inspire, and the stuff in cats in one project? Yeah. Um, I think right now for the user experience, it's really bad that we have CAT scanner and type level algebra and Spire. Um, but before I say that I want to move things back in, into CAT, I want to be sure that the hierarchy we have is, is, is good. I think it's sound, but maybe it's a bit too precise that I, I don't know. Um, but I think we should probably decide on the timeline and, and try to get to like, a, like an answer by that deadline and, and, and get things a bit more integrated. But um, I haven't discussed with, with people working on CATS or algebra yet uh, about this. Like, um, yeah. All right, we have time for more questions. Maybe one more. All right, then let's thank. Oh no, wait, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just thought of one, and there might not be an answer. I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Um, I, guess, I guess something that would help. If, figure out if we need to shift things around between the three, among the three projects would be 
Um, do we have any idea how, like, what slices of these libraries people are using? I'm, I'm just kind of curious because, like, Cats, Cats goes farther than Scala Z, for instance, uh -huh. um, in terms of this this tower. So Scala Z stops with with Monoid, yeah. and Cats goes to has groups and lattices yeah. in Cats kernel. Yeah. And Algebra goes farther. And do we have any idea what people are using? I know what I'm using, and I'm uh, I work in like. Uh, computational physics, so it's, it's very different from like what people will use cat, cats for. So I, I tried to get a feeling during Scala days, like, hey, what, what are the structures? And people came with like very nice things, like, oh, I read this book about the, mathem like, the mathematical structure of, of accounting, like type classes for, you know, uh, um, you know computing tax, for example. This is. Uh, but I have no idea how, or what's, what's relevant for business. Um, I think right now I would kind of stay around when people say numerical computing or numerical analysis, like you're not going to crazy mathematical structures, like put that to the, the, the baseline. I mean, maybe what's in a computer graphics textbook, for example. Like, um, and then the question is how much precision do you want in the intermediate steps? Because it's very difficult to, to choose on things back in a inheritance hierarchy when, when, when you're not uh, controlling that. Um, but right now we are super precise and I don't know how much that's a, that's a barrier. Um, I mean, it's probably a discussion we are not going to have in the like, remaining minute or, or something. But any, any people interested, please come to me at the next break. I'd, I'd love to have your input on that. All right. Well then, let's thank the speaker again.